The following program is produced by students of the Brian Lamb School of Communication at Purdue University. On this week's edition of Fast Track, we will find out how Purdue professors achieve tenure, visit the Black Cultural Center, and check out a campus radio station. We'll visit a new art gallery and stop by a center on campus that's changing the way we communicate research concepts. Finally, we will hear about a new organization on campus, meet up with a student entrepreneur, and stop by the Purdue Butcher Block. It's all coming up next on Fast Track. Welcome back to Fast Track. We're bringing you this week's show from the Union Club Hotel. I'm Jenny Strauch. And I'm John Rawlings. While students are hard at work attending classes and doing homework, so are most of their professors. At Purdue and other universities like it, professors are researching year-round as they work to achieve tenure. How do professors manage teaching courses and achieving tenure at the same time? Lewis Day has more on the story. Publish or perish a mentality that is all too common in the academic community that affects more than just professors. Tenure is a coveted position that requires one of three major tracks to achieve it, research, teaching, or engagement. At an institution such as Purdue, the most common path to tenure is the research path. In order to achieve tenure, a professor is given a five-year period to become a credible, published researcher. If he or she fails to publish, that will generally spell the end of his or her employment as a professor at the university, hence perish. When we bring a new young assistant professor into the program, one of the things that we really look at is uh, we're making a bet. Is this person going to be able to achieve tenure here at Purdue? Are they likely to achieve it? And uh, that, that's a very important judgment that we make when we're interviewing people for those jobs. When professors are researching, sometimes balancing teaching, family, and research can be difficult. However, some of the best professors are those who are also some of the best researchers. Robin Clare is a professor in the Brian Lamb School of Communication who has proven just that. She has won numerous awards for her work both in and out of the classroom. Perhaps the reason she is so well known and celebrated among her peers is how she strives to integrate her research into the classroom. This not only enhances the lessons, but it also keeps the students engaged in the current research. Yeah, I, I know that this, it sounds crazy, but it's like you, you just always put your students first. You just you say, I have to be in class. So I have to get this ready for class. So, And then you find ways to to incorporate your research either into class, at times that works out well. If it doesn't, then you get the research done at other times. Integrating research into teaching is easy for many of those who have reached tenure. Professors who achieve tenure have generally been published many times. Often they forget how many articles, books, or chapters they have authored or co-authored. I know I had to go and look this up because I haven't counted them in so long. Um, so I have 45 articles and book chapters, and I have 60 conference papers, plus, 60 plus conference papers, and four books. So when you put that together, it's over 100. Depending on how you count them, I've, I've got about uh, pushing 70 now papers and, uh, and a couple of, uh, a couple of books. Uh, so I'm on two textbooks now. Professors at places such as Purdue are given a little help in balancing their time as they teach and work toward tenure. Most professors who are in the midst of researching are only given two classes to teach that semester. This allows for more time in the laboratory or out in the field conducting their research. While the process of achieving tenure can be a very long and stressful road, it can also be a very rewarding one. Professors such as Robin Clare demonstrate daily what it means to be an effective researcher and teacher. For Fast Track, I'm Lewis Day. Purdue's campus is home to many centers and organizations where students and members of the community can engage in culturally diverse opportunities. One of these places is the Black Cultural Center. Anne Cherise Taylor takes us there for more. This evening we're here at the Black Cultural Center where students are preparing for a busy yet exciting school year, which includes performances and events that revolve around the Gullah folklore. 
The Black Cultural Center was founded in the late 1960s um, as a result of nationwide civil rights movements that were taking place across the country where black students felt like they wanted to have more involvement within the curriculum and within social movements on higher educating campuses. We have the five ensembles, Jahari Dance Troupe, um, Black Thought Collective, Haraka Riders, New Directional Players, and Black Voices of Inspiration. Black Voices of Inspiration is one of the most popular and diverse ensembles at the Black Cultural Center. Every year, singers come together to practice and perform shows all over the country. We'll do different genres like jazz, um, classical, we've done songs in Latin, Spanish, We've done African style music, but we're known mostly for our gospel music. The Jahari Dance Troupe is also another ensemble at the Black Cultural Center that brings guests from all over to enjoy culturally enriched performances each semester. It's almost like a family. We uh, come together every Tuesday and Thursday and sometimes Saturdays. Um, so it's a big commitment. So you know that all the girls here are here because they love to dance. The ensembles at the Black Cultural Center focus on a specific cultural theme. This year's theme is the Gullah folklore. The Gullah folklore is the legacy and tradition of African people who inhabited land from North Florida to South Carolina. The fall is our research semester. What that means is that all of our programming, uh, everything, even the guest artists that come in, they will be focusing on the Gullah and, and what it means to be Gullah. So over the course of the semester, we will have shows, we will have events, uh, all focusing on the Gullah. Aside from the performing arts ensembles, the Black Cultural Center offers students and members of the community other resources, such as a library and a full functioning ITAP lab, where students can study and do homework. The Black Cultural Center is a place where there is something for everyone. Anyone is able to participate in this, whether they're in the community or if they are someone who is a Purdue student. The Black Cultural Center is located on the corner of 3rd and Russell Street near the Co-Rec and is open to the public Monday through Friday. This is Anne-Cherise Taylor reporting for Fast Track. Coming up, we'll stop by Purdue's campus radio station and find out how students can get involved. We will also visit a new art gallery that is giving local artists a chance to shine. It's all coming up right here on Fast Track. I am an American. 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 That's the way most of us put it, just matter of fact. They're plain words, those four. You could write them on your thumbnail or sweep them across a bright autumn sky. But remember, too, that they are more than just words. They are a way of life. So whenever you speak them, speak them firmly. Speak them proudly. Speak them gratefully. I am an American. I am an American. I am an American. I am an American. That's one small step for man. One Produce public radio station WBAA has been around for almost a century and is continuing to grow. They are currently looking for students who are interested in talk radio and are launching a new app for listeners. Alice Kang has more on the story. WBAA was licensed on April 4, 1922 as an AM radio station. Dating back to the World War II era, students were able to experiment how to intercept Morse code and from there they were able to transform into a public radio station. The students play a very important role here because if you go back to the beginning of when this station began in 1922. It was an experimental frequency. Uh, it was before the Federal Communications Commission and students were working on this radio station as an experiment before it was even official, before they even knew about broadcasting or knew how to regulate it. Today, WBAA has been on air for over 90 years and they are continuing to grow as a public radio station. One of our big commitments for 2014 and beyond is to really recommit ourselves to the local content as well as the national content that we get through NPR. When we talk to students, we just like to, we like them to know that we're here, that, um, you know, we do have shows that 
um, that appeal to all of our audiences and we're always willing to hear suggestions and um, to try and meet your requests as well. In 2011, WBAA launched a new app that listeners can download through their smartphones and tablets. This has been one of the more popular ways to access WBAA's programs on the go. We think that the app is great because it's a good way for them to stay informed while they're walking to class, while they're in the gym. You know, trends show that younger generations aren't necessarily getting um, their audio from the car as much, but they are through other, through other, other mediums, including um, through their mobile devices. WBAA is a public radio station that covers both local and national news. They are located on Purdue's campus in the basement of Elliott Hall. There are many opportunities for students at WBAA. They are constantly looking for students interested in broadcasting. The students today uh, are part of our staff. They, they get trained, they're professionals, they, uh, they connect with our audience and then they move on hopefully to bigger and better things in their life. But they just like being on the air, they like being involved in broadcasting and so we like having them here. For more information, visit WBAA's website at WBAA.org. Reporting for Fast Track, I'm Alice King. The Purdue Found Art Gallery recently opened up to showcase art to the community. Not only can you view well-known artwork, but the gallery will also feature local artwork as well. Reporter Josh Gimble brings us there for more. Located just right outside of the Lafayette Courthouse here in downtown Lafayette is one of Purdue's hidden artistic treasures the Purdue Fountain Art Gallery. Here you will find modern art, classic art, and even art that's just really bizarre. We'll go ahead inside to show you more. The Fountain Art Gallery opened June of 2013 with a goal of creating a new and different art experience. It, the idea for here is to do things that vary back and forth, that give people a different experience each time. It, they'll basically reflect what we do on campus, which is uh, exhibits of national, regional, international, and, uh, and things from our permanent collection that we, we own you know, for the Purdue University. And those kinds of shows you know, alternate back and forth. And sometimes they're solo shows, like this one is one individual artist, and sometimes they're a group show of maybe as many as 30 or 40 artists. Currently, the gallery is showing the art of Emily Trick, a sculptor from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. But art isn't the only feature at the gallery. This winter, they offered live concerts to all of their guests. We presented something called Wintry Mix, which was uh, a noontime concerts at lunch every year, was, you know, and it was meant for people to bring their ba you know, bag lunches or to buy lunch and bring it in. And we had a different concert every day, you know, from jazz to uh, there was a, a singer and a, a video projection, and there was a uh, there was a recorder ensemble that played music, and there were you know different you know combinations every day. So it was just a different thing to get people in to see the space and to have a little something you know different in here. Another unique feature of this gallery is hidden in its very walls: clay figurines made by several local area art teachers add a cultural feel to this venue. Purdue student Danielle Cirilla agrees. I think the artwork in here is really cool. I've never seen anything like that. Art galleries are known to be a bit pricey, but the Fountain Gallery wants to be known for just the opposite. We always like to emphasize that the galleries are free and open to anybody. It's not, you know, our Purdue University galleries are not intended solely for Purdue University students, faculty, and staff. They're meant for the whole community. The Purdue Fountain Art Gallery is open Tuesday through Saturday from noon to 7 p.m. Reporting for Fast Track, I'm Josh Gimble. After the break, we will check out the Envision Center and find out how a new organization is raising awareness for a global issue. We'll also find out how a student turned entrepreneur and stopped by the Purdue Butcher Block. It's all coming up next on Fast Track. I am poised under pressure. I led Purdue to a come from behind victory in my first start. I'm focused on the field and in class. I draw inspiration from the cradle of quarterbacks. I am Rob Henry, and I am a Boilermaker. ...that we do, and, and we try and, and... You, yeah, you. Have you ever dreamed of being on TV? 
Well, in the Brian Lamb School of Communication, we do more than that. You can learn about camera operation, lighting techniques, live TV shows, real client PSAs, weekly news productions, and more. For more information about the video production programs, visit our website or the advising office. Welcome back. If you've ever walked down the tunnel between the Union and Stewart Center, you might have noticed a room full of large screens and computers called the Envision Center. But have you ever wondered what happens in there? Reporter Ming Jin Sui takes us inside the Envision Center for more. Down under the Purdue Memorial Union, there's a place where it offers you a new perspective towards research data and maybe even towards the world. The, the biggest thing that the Envision Center really provides is, is the knowledge and the know-how uh, that the faculty might not have enough time as well as the resources and the technology that uh, they might not be able to afford or might not have the time to invest in researching how to use it. So by having the Envision Center, uh, we can actually help learn, uh, let's say, a programming package or a visualization package that they might not be familiar with or we can introduce them to new technologies or new techniques of visualization. CAVE is a reconfigurable virtual theater that allows environments and data virtualization to be experienced in new and engaging ways. One of our largest ongoing projects is with the pharmacy department. Uh, we have the virtual pharmacy clean room uh, that we run here and the pharmacy department has a regular ongoing uh, update system through that uh, program and brings the students here to the Envision Center every, uh, every year to utilize that as a part of the, the course curriculum. However, this million dollar facility may not be affordable for many researchers. The Envision Center is striving to develop programs that can be explored with much cheaper and portable devices. Able Lab is a virtual simulation of a chemical lab that can be toured from any computer with an internet connection. The purpose of Able Lab is to show people the difference of operating a uh, chemical procedure uh, between uh, people who can walk around without disability and people who are bound to wheelchairs. We made a scenario where like, uh, uh, you throw a grenade in a biochemical lab and you catch on fire and you go to the emergency shower to pull it off. The emergency shower has, uh, has two poles, a uh, long one and a short one. The long one is for people who cannot reach high. Uh, for people who are on wheelchair. We're sort of looking at more holistic uh, presentations of these materials. Um, so we're not just creating one application that runs in the cave environment uh, where you can navigate in here, but you have to come here. Instead, we're creating uh, things that can be deployed to the web, simulations that can be deployed to the web, uh, videos that you can watch on YouTube, things that can be displayed in the classroom. So how many Purdue students are engaged in this innovative project? We currently have nine student employees. Uh, we work with uh, graduate, PhD, as well as undergraduate students from all across Purdue, uh, uh, across multiple majors, from computer graphics, computer technologies, uh, engineering, computer science, as well as every once in a while we even get people from the arts department as well to work with our art assets. So there are two girls working at the Envision Center right now, uh, Mary and I. Well, I've been working at the Envision Center for about two and a half years now and it's been one of the best experiences of my college career, really. All the different opportunities, all the different projects, I have learned so many things here that I would have never gotten in the classroom. Yeah, definitely there are sometimes uh, it's very challenging because sometimes like uh, uh, it's very hard for clients to communicate their, uh, their needs uh, for the project and sometimes that uh, they don't see the progress that we made like we see them from a developer's perspective. Uh, we conquer that by saying yes to the client all the time. If they, if they really want that, we make it happen. I think it's actually what gets me up in the morning excited to come here every day and uh, be able to basically have these very amazing, you know, what would are essentially toys, but to do use them in such a fashion that are empowering researchers. I find that what I really enjoy doing is what I'm doing right now, which is working with the professors or other individuals, the clients who have these very, very interesting and important ideas to get their vision into a reality. You know. If you are interested in learning more about virtual reality, render videos and simulation, please register to attend the seminars provided by the Purdue Envision Center. Reporting for Fast Track, Ming Jiancui. Swipe Out Starvation is a new student organization on campus that is dedicated to helping students find ways to help alleviate hunger both locally and abroad. 
the organization has come a long way and products from the organization can be found in dining halls and Grey House Coffee Shop. Fast Track reporter Jasmine Edwards looks into the journey of Swipe Out Starvation. If you've been to Grey House Coffee Shop lately, you may have noticed a new initiative they are supporting that has close ties with Purdue. Now, when you purchase Grey House products to curb your thirst or hunger, you can donate 99 cents to help Swipe Out Starvation do the same. Initially, students didn't really do a whole lot with the cards. They weren't familiar with what was going on or how the program worked. So I wouldn't say we had a lot of traction on Monday. Tuesday, once the word started to get out, it picked up a lot. Students got really excited and started taking as many cards as they'd be allowed to take, um, asking us tons of questions, which was great. We had a lot of success at Earhart and Windsor. Earhart came in with the top sales number for the pilot week, and then Windsor came in in a close second. Swipe Out Starvation is a student-led organization at Purdue that started just a few years ago. It began with a few students, Peter Bender, Jeff Wojcicki, and G.J. Gilliam, creating and acting on the idea to help alleviate hunger locally and globally in a way that would be tangible to students who have a meal plan and eat in the dining halls. The way the program works is that when students go into the dining hall food stores called On The Go, students can replace one of their four items with a Swipe Out Starvation card. The proceeds that would have went to that extra bag of chips or candy will now go to Lafayette Food Finders Food Bank or Land of a Thousand Hills Coffee Farm in Rwanda. Swipe Out Starvation actually meets the need. It's not a, a campaign for um, more attention necessarily or a hopeful attempt to bring support in, it's like actually generating dollars and getting it into the hands of the people who need it uh, most, both locally and overseas. Since the way students pay for this food at the dining halls is by swiping their Purdue ID cards through the register, the name Swipe Out Starvation seems to be well suited. Anyone who is interested in participating in Swipe Out Starvation can do so at any of the on-the-go locations on campus or at Grey House Coffee Shop located at 100 Northwestern Avenue. This is Jasmine Edwards reporting for Fast Track. A tool of multiple purpose, better known as Atom, is a key-sized gadget created by a Purdue engineering student. Reporter Ming Jin Sui sat down with the creator of the tool to talk about the process and how he transformed himself from engineer to entrepreneur. In my hand is a tiny key-sized tool created by a biomedical engineer. What is the bigger story behind this tiny gadget? How did an engineer become an entrepreneur? Well, today we're going to find out more. I designed Adam through uh, just a very simple series of steps where you start with a sketch of the design to kind of lay out the features of the product. And then from there, you can design it in a really simple 3D modeling software like Google SketchUp, for example. And then with that, you can actually print out or 3D print a prototype out of, out of plastic. So it gives you a great representation of what the product would look like. Sean Connell started a campaign on a crowdsourcing website. And the small gadget turned out to be a big thing on the internet. For the Kickstarter campaign, I needed to raise $40,000 in order to cover the cost of manufacturing the product. So in the first 10 days, I was able to reach that funding goal. And then in the end, I ultimately raised $83,000, which was about 207% of what I needed. Compared to other bulky tools, Atom, a tool for multipurpose, is convenient for taking around. However, the neat design does not come out of nothing overnight. It started becoming this multi-tool wallet and it was really convoluted and confusing. And when I showed it to people, I got really negative feedback and, and they said that you should lose some of these features and focus just on the multi-tool aspect of it. And as I started showing these designs to friends and family members, I got some good feedback. And one of them actually suggested that you make a pink version that appeals to women and then uh, use some of the profit from that to actually donate it for breast cancer research. Kickstarter marks Chan's turning from an engineer into an entrepreneur. For Purdue students, crowdsourcing website may be a start of business. I did a significant amount of research on Kickstarter itself, uh, not only the business model that Kickstarter was offering, but also on some of the other products similar to the multi-tool I designed that were on Kickstarter already. And that gave me a sense of, of what was successful, what worked and what didn't work, and also prepared me to launch a more successful Kickstarter campaign. Traditional financing routes, you have to create extensive plans. Um, you have probably a very low probability of 
buy, people buying into your idea, and it takes many, many months um, to raise money often for, for new ventures. So I think it's kind of a democratization of, of funding for entrepreneurship. I think you get a lot of good feedback. You put something out there and you can get feedback on your product right away. Um, it's a, just a great way to test the waters, and if it works, you can always go for those additional sources of funding. More interestingly, Sean's collaborations with others on this project are mostly through emails. What's interesting is because a lot of the help I got has been completely virtual. So, for example, the, the, the person I hired on Elance has been completely communication through emails. I, I've never met the man. And I also relied on a lot of other people. For example, I uh, hired an industrial design student here on Purdue's campus in order to help me kind of sketch out the final design in order to show that to people and kind of represent the concept of the multi-tool. I sent an email to the head of our department and he ended up sending a mass email to all of the students in industrial design, I think just the sophomores, juniors, and seniors. I sent him my portfolio, first of all, and he said that he liked the sketch work that I had in it, and so we set up a meeting to talk about the project. And Sean said he's starting another online business with his sister. As we were walking around her house, we saw this fruit fly trap that she had made that was basically just a bowl of dead flies. So. We got to talking and designed actually a, a more minimalistic and cleaner looking fruit fly trap. And so we're going to take it through the very same process we did with the multi-tool where we started with very basic sketches, worked with some people on Elance to design the actual model, and then 3D printed some prototypes, and then finally we'll take it to Kickstarter to mass produce it. Anyone can go out and design a product. You don't necessarily have to have the specific skill sets from start to finish. You can rely on other people's expertise. Ming Jiancui, reporting for Fast Track. With Purdue's impressive agricultural reputation, it should come as no surprise that a butcher can be found right here on campus. The Boilermaker Butcher Block has been around for 40 years, but remains one of Purdue's best kept secrets. Kara Miller has the story. For many people, it is a surprise that there is a place to purchase fresh meat right here on Purdue's campus. A lot of people didn't even know about it. It's a pretty well kept secret people tell me. Uh, uh, it's been here forever and we still have people come in and say, never heard of this before. And I actually didn't know about it until uh, I had a lecture in the butcher room in Smith uh, and the professor was trying to explain to us that usually the lecture in there has to do with butchering animals um, and that was why there was the big mirror and the stuff on the ceiling, um, and then I found out later that they actually sell the stuff that students learn how to cut. But the Boilermaker Butcher Block has been around since 1973 and serves a variety of meat to students and the community. We've got beef, pork, lamb, goat, chicken. Uh, we used to have turkey, we now have turkey breast, but uh, that's the only turkey and ground turkey, I guess. One of the most surprising facts about the Butcher Block is that it is almost entirely run by students. Gary Waters and I are the two full-time uh, meat cutter managers of the Butcher Block, and, uh, and then other than that, we have about uh, five to seven student employees that help. Along with being run by students, all of the Butcher Block's meat is homegrown right here at Purdue. It's grown out at the Purdue Farms and uh, brought in here and they walk in and carried it out in packages. So. Patrons can come in during business hours and either pull purchases from the freezer or ask for them directly. The Butcher Block is known for its quality meat and because the shop breaks even on all produce, prices are comparable to those of a large grocery store. If you're looking for the perfect cut of meat for your seasonal dinner, you can find it at the Butcher Block. Uh, we have seasonal, like in the fall we have a lot of brats and, and in the summer we do a lot of steaks and chops and grilling stuff but, uh, and in the fall we do a lot of tailgating uh, cuts. So the next time you're looking to purchase meat, make sure to stop by the Butcher Block. This is Kara Miller reporting for Fast Track. That's all we have time for on this week's edition of Fast Track. Thanks for watching. I'm Jenny Strauch. And I'm John Rawlings. Join us again next week on Fast Track. Thank <laughs> you.